Word Balloon is brought to you by the League of Word Balloon Listeners. Every part of comics and artwork is a form of communication with other people. It's not just a, here, let me direct my thoughts at you as a dictation of concept, but it's hoping to convince you of how cool you think a visual could be or a story could be. And you're trying to communicate ideas and in one part storytelling and greater part just graphic impact. You're hoping to relate a sense of energy, urgency, and enthusiasm to people. That there's a lightning of spirit that comes out of superheroes that has always worked for me. That it isn't really about the practicality of what they might do. About It's not the practicality about grown men punching each other in costumes. It really isn't about that. It's a visual metaphor. And that metaphor could be for a lot of things, but it's mostly just about the energy and enthusiasm that can be found in the fun of life. Welcome back, everybody. It's time again for Word Balloon, the comic book conversation show. John Suntress here. Happy to have Margaret Larkin joining me tonight, a novelist who has made a fantastic book that is so worthy of your attention and I think very timely for the period of nostalgia that we're in right now. Wicker Park Wishes. Great cover uh, by Margaret's uh, husband, in fact. So uh, congratulations, Margaret. It's a terrific book. Thank you. And um, he's a master designer. He works for, I mean, he's, he's introverted. I told him I'd give him a shout out, but um, people who work with him know that he's really amazing. He's a really good, he's very good at color, et cetera. So he can probably relate to some of the topics that some of you, some of the people, and I don't know if you hear, there's like explosions outside where I live. So I do, I do not hear explosions. Okay. Are, are they like fireworks or what? Hopefully probably. Fireworks. Yeah. Because yeah. a lot of people are celebrating Mexican independence. Of Day. course. Yes, indeed. And they've been, they've been driving around my area for more than a few days and today it's oh, a yeah. culmination so. no you know and i and i uh and yeah it's usually the 15th or the 16th i know it's always mid september and at first uh, i was grabbing coffee before our talk and i saw a car that had a mexican flag and a puerto rican flag and i'm like oh yeah mexican independence you know yeah. hispanic independence or whatever I, and forgive me folks i don't remember the specific uh, holiday but i'm always aware of it and of course for my boxing love there's always a fantastic Mexican versus Puerto Rican fight every, like usually every year because they know it's a massive draw. And I remember too, uh, in the period of your book, uh, there was a great one with Hector Macho Camacho and Julio Cesar okay. Chavez. And yeah. it was one that was uh, brewing for years and Chavez absolutely wanted this fight and he destroyed Camacho. Yeah. And truly the hatred for Camacho did not end with the win. I mean, mm -hmm. even in the post-fight interview and stuff, you know, Chavez is still just angry as hell. And, you know, Camacho even just existing in the same ring. So Yeah, I'm just wondering what's happening with Humboldt Park. Humboldt Park is a more Puerto Rican area. And I was there on Sunday. Lots of Puerto Rican flags, Puerto Rican music, Puerto Rican sure. people. And now I'm wondering if any Mexican flags might be flying over there. But I don't live in, in Humboldt Park, so. No, I understand. No, you're you're downtown. You're, real, you're Lois Lane. You're right there at the heart of the city. And, yes. Uh, and then, yeah, and also I should say, uh, we've known each other for a long time because we work together at WBBM, the CBS uh, news radio station that's right. a legendary station here in Chicago. Yeah, and it's, uh, it's it's actually down there. I can walk there. I still work there sometimes, so I walk down there. No, that's great. Yeah, you're a news writer there. And truly, Margaret, honestly, you not uh, doing novels, and, and, and also, by the way, you're also a great podcaster. Uh, oh, you, thank you. You started a great podcast called Radio Girl uh, in the infancy of uh, podcasting just well, a couple of years after I started. Yeah, I was second wave. You were first wave. I always give you credit because I am proud of the fact that I started. I started messing around in 2008. Yeah. But then I started, I committed in 2009. And that's yeah. also when I created a business. So it all came together. But the business was not podcasting. The business was to publish 
um, published uh, an anthology of other people's of bloggers' works. And oh then, wow! Yeah, and then um, and then the business just became an umbrella for a lot of things I do around Chicago. But well, yeah, po podcasting. I was your side. I was behind you, but I didn't know you. No, no, that's all right. I wish I knew you because but I, I was aware help. of you. I mean, you were really talking to even back in 09, a lot of the top radio personalities and you continue to do it. And uh, no, it's a great uh, audio history of Chicago broadcasting. I was very envious. I'll be honest, because I'm like, oh, damn it. Radio girl beat me to it. I'm Ooh. like, this is, this is so. <laughs> well, the, the big, the big, inter <laughs> the, big inter the big interview I got was who's passed away since uh, then is um, Howard Stern's old program director. And that's what got me to another level. <laughs> Kevin and I, everyone Kevin remember Matheny. from Kevin, say it again. Kevin Matheny. Kevin Matheny, who, if you saw the movie, Pig Vomit. Yeah, uh, and actually, is... somebody said the Pig Vomit was a combination of two different people. But oh. yes, he was really, he was really, um, he was really Howard Stern's program director. And what happened was he was a program director where I was working at WGN Radio. And I thought, oh, I'd love to interview him. And it took me several months, but eventually I convinced him. And I think I did a good job. And actually his sister told me on Facebook or some, she said somewhere, she said, thank you for respecting my brother. Cause it was a very laid back thing, but really what, sure. what got me attention though, is that a lot of people listened to it and they contacted Howard Stern's show and it show and some of the audio showed up on the news channel. And yes. Howard 100. Show. Absolutely. Go on. And, and then it's, yeah. So it showed up on there and then it showed up on Howard Stern show, but he wouldn't name me. He wouldn't even say podcast. He would say, Oh yeah, he was on some radio show. I'm like, eh, but I got the audio somehow from some nerd website and I pulled yeah. it. But um, yeah, then I really got, and then also Robert Feeder uh, covered it. Robert Feeder is a very good person and he's a columnist here in Chicago, Chicago media. And he wrote a column about it. <laughs> So what started out as just a way to deal with the frustration of radio became something that actually helped me. That's yeah. interesting. And I understand. I uh, Well, two things. One, it is great to have those kinds of interviews where people only know somebody by reputation and sometimes by negative reputation. And a couple of years before he died, Jerry Krause did a uh, the Bulls GM during the Bulls dynasty of the 90s. We're still on the 90s in both uh, Kevin... Uh, Pig vomit and also and also Kraus. Um, it, it was great to uh, get Jerry's side of the story on the record, Ooh. and I think that's great because I really a, a lot of people are painted by um, articles or or films about them where they're a character, right. and you get a really one sided depiction of someone, and you don't really get the fully balanced yeah. story, and I think that's important. Well, also, what was what was interesting is that I think the movie portrayed him as this really hyper guy, this hopped up guy. But big when, moment, yeah. But I okay, never hung out with the guy. For some reason, people thought I was friends with him. I wasn't friends with the guy. I just didn't badmouth him. Yeah. And he was actually very mild acting, and he was very visionary, and he seemed like a good person. But the thing, the thing that really bothered me back then, and this is why people, for some reason, for some reason, thought I was friends with him. Is because people were bad mouthing him, but they didn't know him, and right. I don't. I don't like that because neither do I. I don't care whether you're famous or not. If you don't like a person, that's basically smearing them. Plus, he's got daughters, okay? And no, he loved I mean, his daughters. Well, yeah, they're human beings. I mean, that's the thing we only know yeah. about them. God, it happens in in comics all the time. Yeah. Where and and really in geek culture, where someone is vilified, and it's like, all right, maybe take a step back. You don't have to agree with the guy on everything. And I think in the case of, and forgive me, I'm uh, Kevin, I'll say Kevin, uh, because I have uh, short-term memory issues right now. But because uh, also I really want to focus on the book. But, um, you know, again, it, it's like uh, he was a very successful program director mm -hmm. that was uh, not uh, conducive to the kind of radio Stern was. Right. Doing. Stern was really a rabble rouser. Obviously, right. we all know this. And most program directors, they want order. And I, right. you know, so yeah, I mean, I understand why they would conflict. And also that maybe, and again, not being there, but I could see like a program director, like, Hey, I'm the sheriff, uh, right. you know, get in line. I've certainly experienced that in my radio career but uh, he, he also without said, doing anything. And it's just kind of a program director establishing rules. And most of the time, you know, in the back of your head, you're like, and in fact, this is something that I think plays out in as well in Wicker Park Wishes, where you've got um, Claire, your your main character, 
who's tempting at a company and, right. and doing that's very this. Typical. To, that's, that's tempting. Yeah. That's one of the things that that's changed over the years. Uh, because, there's a, there's a lot of stuff in there that obviously it is a different world now than yeah. the first century than it was in the nineties. But yeah, man, I mean, so, so I get the, the conflict of, right. of Kevin and Stern. And again, let's give Kevin his chance to tell his side of the story. I don't know how much you delved into that in your interview with them. Well, no, I did. But of course, you know, you know how it is when you interview people, you know what you want to talk about, but you can't launch into it because you're not friends with the person. So I had to start out, you know, I had to start out soft about WGN, about the weather, right. whatever, about so-and-so yeah. who's so pretty or whatever. And then we, we, we both worked with, and then it got into Stern and, and I think what surprised I think what surprised people was how mellow he sounded, but that's how he was because he was different from the movie. And I think even uh, Stern was saying, "Oh, it was a boring interview." Whatever, dude. I mean, okay, I'm not you. Okay, I don't have access. But yeah, how was shit done every <laughs> God? You know, growing up here, and I don't know if uh, if you ever had any encounters with the great Roger Ebert. No. Well, yeah, um, and sorry, but on a Stern tangent for a moment, um, he was considered for the morning job at WXRT. I don't know if you knew that. Oh, no. And WXRT is the progressive rock station here in Chicago. Wait, Roger Ebert? No, no, no. Oh. Howard Stern, excuse me. Okay, and, I was like, uh, okay. Yeah, Stern was being considered for the morning show. Right. And um, much like uh, his relationship with Kevin, uh, the program and, and management of XRT, it wasn't going to work. Right. And uh, Stern had Ebert on his show and Stern tried really hard to shit on WXRT as a station. And, oh, you know, these guys, right. they don't get me. And, and and Ebert was like, you're right, Howard. They don't get you. But that said, WXRT is one of the greatest right. radio stations in the country. It is incredibly progressive when it comes to its music choices. And it's a great, great station. And, uh, by the way, and uh, Norm Weiner, the, the program director, then he's like, is is a great guy. And, uh, yeah, but uh, he, he did X, Y, and Z. It's like Howard... Again, I'm going to disagree with you, and I'm not going to let you shit on XRT and Norm Weiner. Well, at that time, was he really big, though? Was Who? the Harrison really big when oh. they were considering him? No, this was um, – I don't know if it – I believe it was uh, the D.C. years before he was in New York, wow. or it might have been the Detroit years. Whoa. Um, okay. But regardless, um, yeah, and and the, the secret that Stern didn't know about Ebert was when Norm Weiner moved to Chicago – uh, Ebert had a giant house that had a coach house in the front. And, Are you talking about uh, the one on the north side in Lincoln Park? Yes. And uh, and uh, Norm and his wife, Wendy, lived in that house for like a couple of years. And Ebert was their landlord and, you know, great friends with Norm and Wendy. And, and yeah, it's like, I mean, again, Ebert never like let his card show. But it's wow. like, yeah, sorry, Howard. Guess what? This guy's great. And it's okay to be great, and you're great too, and not agree with how to do radio. And I and I love that. And obviously, Ebert I mean, knew what he was talking about because he's the one that gave Oprah the syndication uh, advice. There you go. So there you Absolutely. go. He knows. Have you heard? As we're on the podcast subject, um, the Ringer, um, Bill uh, Simmons' network of podcasts. I can't remember the specific show. But uh, they did a they did a side mini series within their show about Ebert and Siskel and the whole history Ooh. from sneak previews to their deaths. Neat. It's it's so so. I good. watched sneak previews for years, and I just oh, want to say, I guess, I, sorry, I'm I'm in, I'm being um. There there is so much honking outside because I live near Michigan Avenue, which is a major street in Chicago, and basically any hey Laura, what's up? Um, <laughs> <laughs> but basically anytime there's anything important. Like, you know, somebody won the election or whatever, or they, they disagree with something. It happens like a block away from where I live. So all I hear is constant honking. So anyway, I'm uh, distracted. We can't hear it. So don't, don't sweat No, I'm it. distracted I mean, in my in my place. Yeah, but. I understand. It's okay. It's a good no, thing I didn't sit outside on my balcony. Again, we're talking about a lot of Chicago subjects, and that's good. Yeah. Because Wicker Part Wishes is, is all about that. And I really, uh, I told you off the air, and I mean this, um, it's... Uh, it's uh, I see a kinship with uh, Nick Hornsby's best stuff, and I would say for people who are fans of either the book or the film, High Fidelity, more so the film, because I I think um, was John Cusack in that film? Yeah, he went to yeah. my high school. Oh, that's fine. I didn't know he, you had, he graduated a few years ahead of me. Yeah, well, no, yeah. I didn't know I didn't know him, but yeah. Uh, yeah, John was a contemporary of mine, and uh, he was at Evanston, and I was at New Trier. Yeah, and I would see him as a kid. 
uh, at a lot of the record shops in Evanston, wow. you know, things like deluxe records and vintage uh, vinyl, vintage vinyl, vintage and vinyl still there. Every, if, oh, anybody's, yeah. if anybody's interested in true vinyl and historical music, um, it's on Davis street in Evanston. That's a plug there. It's still open and there's yeah. still pink. great little <laughs> neighborhood too. There's a great bakery. That's, Tennyson's Bakery is still there. Yep. Yeah. And uh, great pizza, great uh, slice pizza. GGO's. GGO's is still there. Still Absolutely, there, yeah. man. Yeah. No, that's a fun neighborhood. And again, that's why I really, I mean, you and I are, aren't that far apart in years. And and um, you, I really think, contextually really bring 90s Chicago and the suburbs back in yeah. your book. I mean, it's very, very vivid in the same ways that uh, for people who maybe are New York aficionados, can can read something or watch something yeah. and go, oh my God, this is New York. Well, this is Chicago. This is the lifestyle of being somebody in your 20s when you're just kind of figuring out who you are right. and you're dealing with shit jobs that you don't want to be right. in and hookups that happen and stuff. Exactly, you know? yeah. Yeah, it's uh, it's terrific. Tell us about your character. Claire. Well, I was going to say, first of all, for the New oh, Yorkers out there, I would compare it to Williamsburg in the early 90s. Now Williamsburg is a really nice area, and it's completely gentrified. But back in the early 90s, I went there, actually. It was pr pretty rough, and that's what Wicker Park was. So hello, hello yes. you New Yorkers. And you don't have to be from Chicago to appreciate no. this book because people have read it from different places. But no, basically, the main character is somebody who's from a well-off background. Okay, so let, if we're talking about New York, it's the equivalent of Westchester. Um, she's yeah. from the North Shore of Chicago. I'd say Kenilworth area. I don't specify it, but it's okay. It's the people you went to high school with, John, because you went to yeah. one of those. She, I she went schools. to the Trier, No, and Kenilworth was like the rich right. suburb right next to my suburb, Wilmet. Wilmet had its wealth too. Right. Uh, the whole, East as Wilmet. you say, the north, the North Shore really was kind of the nice. Uh, the really that's where. A lot of the city people went in the late yeah. 50s to raise their families. My father, no exception. Right. So, you know, but you, don't, yeah. you don't strike me as North Shore at all. I'm shocked well, that you're from Wilmette. Dad was, you went to New Trier. Dad was a restaurant owner and yeah. was kind of uh, this working class guy yeah. who was in such a well doing cash business yeah. that he could afford a nice house back in the late 50s. And yeah, I mean, you know, he, he did fine. You know, I was, I was called my father Diamond Jim because he, He's like Ralph Cramden uh, in the old Honeymooners when he gets all the comfort cutter yeah. for money. And he's like, man, when I had it, I spent it, baby. Right. I spent it. And he did. He, I mean, he would take golf trips all around the country. Yeah. Uh, we got to fly on jets at a, I mean, at a, you know, in late 60s, early 70s. Neat. 1970, I went to Disneyland for the first time. Good nice. Lord, that was 50, you know, 50 plus years ago. Right. Uh, but no, it was, uh, yeah, it was, I mean, again, Dad had the money, but it wasn't from like old families of of wealthy people in the way that a lot of Kenilworth people were. Right. They had the mansions and stuff. We had a split level house. It was very middle class. Um, yeah, because but, East Wilmette. Yeah. Because were you from West Wilmette? I'm from West Wilmette. Yeah. Okay, because for you know people don't know, um, West Wilmette is more middle class. East Wilmette is old nicer. Money. Yeah, it's more old money, or it's people who made it big. But yeah, yeah that's so, where Bill Murray uh, was an East Wilmette guy. Ooh, he doesn't he doesn't seem that way. Oh yeah. Well again, Bill was from this working class family that had yeah. like seven or eight children. It's and I never I've yet to meet Bill, but I right. certainly know a lot of Wilmette people yeah. that grew up with the Murray family to yeah. the point where when when some of their uh older uh, relatives would pass away, my friends, you know, older, you know, their parents and grandparents would be at the at the funerals because they were friends with them. OK, so, yeah. And, you know, like my friend actually got to meet Murray a couple of times at sadly, these kind of functions. But right. you really do have this great juxtaposition of where Claire is from growing up in the in the North Shore suburbs and and just dealing with, you know, again, life, life yeah. in the 90s, working class girl, uh, temp jobs. Wicker Park was kind of. An affordable neighborhood at the time. Oh, very affordable. That's what I'm saying. That's why I compared to Williamsburg in uh in in New York because you can in Brooklyn because you could afford it. But yeah. the thing is, okay, actually, she came from a very well off background. The character. Um, so basically, what we would say is she was slumming it. She was having an adventure. She could have gone on the right track. She went to Wash Washington University in St. Louis, which is a really nice. It's it's sort of equivalent to Northwestern. And then she decides yeah. to just do something different and live in Wicker Park. And the most famous example of that, but I don't base the character on this person is Liz Fair because Liz Fair was from that area. Liz Fair lived in Wicker Park at the time, but my character goes to clubs 
with house music. There's no rock or no indie rock or anything like that. It's not that scene. It's the dance right. scene. It's the DJ it's, scene. Yeah, it's the DJ scene, which was the right. next scene after the indie rock scene. By the way, Liz Fair went to my high school two years <laughs> younger than me. So I, I, I wouldn't say we were friends, but we right. were at the same parties because I was a theater kid and Liz was right. a music theater kid. So we all hung yeah. out. I remember also, uh, oh God, now I'm blanking. Um, the star of I Shot Andy Warhol and uh, Lily, Lily Taylor. Okay. Lily was friends with Liz and mm. was a very successful actress in the 80s and 90s. She's in uh, Say Anything. She's one of uh, John Cusack's friends in Say Anything. Okay. You'd know her if you saw her. Yeah. But the thing is with Liz Fair, the only Liz Fair story I have, and I've never met the person, is um, when she, after she made it really big, she had a house in Lincoln Park. I know where it is. I mean, I won't say, but she doesn't live there anymore, obviously. And um, I was working at a, <laughs> I was working at a youth hostel. This is back in the mid nineties. And she parked her car there because they had parking in the back and we had her phone number. And I'm like, I mean, nobody called her. Everybody respected her. Okay. But I was like, wait, Liz fair. Is that the singer? And then I found out, yeah, she's living, she was living in Lincoln park in a really nice house. And then I read her memoir. It's not really a memoir. It's a series of um, essays. Yeah. And um, it's called hanging monster stories. And she um, talked about living in Lincoln park and I just thought, okay, I don't want to say my character's not based on her at all, but it's, it's that concept of growing up, quote unquote, the right way and deciding to have an adventure in Wicker Park, which was very different than now. Now Wicker Park, it still has, you know, a lot of character. I was just there on Sunday, but it is so nice. I mean, I was eating outside on division and i was like oh my god drive by drive by and i'm like you know no there aren't drive bys here i'm like oh yeah you're not right anymore so, no yeah. not anymore i was just very tense and well, even when i yeah i was just gonna say in the period that the book is set and stuff i was working at wxrt and okay. in fact the music director there who has since moved to new york uh she uh she was living in wicker park and it was just starting to gentrify but there were still literally crack houses and yes. Places you could buy drugs very easily, which we see in the in, yes. in your in your book as well. And and yeah, it was it was definitely just starting to turn. And now it's yeah, it's a great, it's a very nice neighborhood. It does still have character. And also, what I love about the, your book is a lot of times they'll go to uh, Claire will go and with uh, one of her romantic interests, Trevor, <laughs> they'll, they'll go to uh, they'll go to cafes. Right. And and they are. And, and this is what I love about Chicago everything hasn't been torn down yet and there right. are what of course now are called dad bars but you know just those like little joints dive. yeah yeah dives that flashes. Were, well and they used there to are be some flashes still left um even on division i saw a slash a slashes you know where you can order you when you can take liquor order liquor to take out and then you can also drink there sure the hipsters sure. tend to go there and enjoy it oh yeah but even even uh, just even the the food you know the, the cafes the food joints right. and everything they used to be like, you know, a lunch counter back right. in the fifties and they never changed the decor yeah. and are just, you know, operating yeah. in a different way now. And I love that. And I love that about New York. And I was very lucky to go the few times I would go to New York, uh, that my buddy Bert Sugar, who uh, edited Ring Magazine and Boxing Illustrated, he would take me to the joints because wow. Those were his hangs and everything. So I got yeah. to see Gallagher Steakhouse before Neat. it tore it down. And we've got a ton of these places here in Chicago, too. And every time, God, especially in the last two years with COVID, yeah. some of these landmark places that haven't been able to survive or even, you know, the owners are retiring and the, the yeah. grandchildren have no desire to, turn, you know, continue the business. Although Miller's it's Pub is still in business. Uh, Miller's Pub is on Wabash, South Wabash. It's near... Um, the right uh, Fort Jackson it's right next to the L it's it's near the Palmer house and that's right yeah that's one of those old school places and it's so good it's just very it's very down to earth that, that's a holdover but yeah because I do mention a restaurant it's more like in the South Loop area in that financial district area which was like everybody's smoking that's another thing is everybody used to smoke <laughs> <laughs> everybody used yes. to smoke everybody rolled their own people rolled their I, own cigarettes. i love that claire rolls her own cigarettes that's yes. fantastic because you could go to head shop actually i've seen some head shops i went into one but yeah they're um, back yeah there were head shop i went to a head shop in normal with the t-shirt i have on um and yeah it was there was lots of stuff show, yeah stand then, up and show your t-shirt for a second because that's hilarious yeah that normal were. theater oh the normal theater sure yeah absolutely my god i love the normal theater and then again yeah. i went to illinois state um yeah. 
and yeah, there were there were a couple. It was so funny. There were a couple very overtly head shoppy places. Yes. And again, when I went to school, this was in the early '80s. They were shut down uh, during my like maybe my sophomore year. Well, one was, and the other one kind of converted into just uh, an old record place that you could still get, you know, patchouli and uh, right. d different incense and things like that. Yeah. And then uh, literally maybe the year after I left, they kind of went back to head shops. And now obviously with that uh, marijuana is legal in Illinois and right. stuff, oh, the head shops are back in full force. Yeah. But, and it's uh, there. they got lots of a variety because when I went to the one in normal, um, uh, there are lots of different options. But back then, though, in the time I'm writing about, it was illegal. Of course. And I do have a scene there, you know, where they're smoking. Um, Actually, there are a lot of, there's a lot of smoking because, you know, it's funny because I have a friend who said, you know, I know somebody who manufactured drugs in Wicker Park. You should write about them. Like, dude, the, the book's already written. OK, it's out. But <laughs> I mean, he's like, yeah, you should talk to me last year or something. Well, but but again, it's that it, it's that you're in your 20s. Um casual attitude towards marijuana um right. and 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 well and again and drinking, of course. were yeah. you and not no, i'm not saying um, marijuana necessarily but were you were you a cigarette smoker back in the 90s yes yeah That's i don't want to get into what i was oh uh, yeah i did i was an idiot um no i mean yeah. i just say i'm an idiot because it's not healthy but well yeah, yeah I mean but again you know <laughs> We all do. We all, you know, we all, we all drink more than we should. I mean, that's what I love is, and that's why I've got the Nick Hornby kind of reference in my head. You know, a lot of chapters open up with poor Claire hungover from right. the night before, exactly. or, you know, and, and that's hookups that don't work. And, you know, the, the, the walk, the, by the way, the walk of shame can happen to men and, and, and does right. as, as, as often as, well, maybe not. I don't know. I well, I've, got, I've gotten some good reactions from guys because first I was thinking, oh, this is like a chick book. And but I've gotten excellent responses from guys. And I was talking to somebody the other day like, oh, my gosh, this is going to be a classic. A man said this. So because I think it's because I don't I don't have her as like a wimpy type. She's no. she's, she's aggressively having a good time, aggressively pursuing guys. I mean, she's got her issues, but and i think you know i don't i don't paint her as a wimp um but the thing is also with the with the head shops and so forth um that i mean now you can see it now it's no big deal but back then you knew that it was illegal but you knew what you were getting into when you walked in so yeah. that's why and it was on milwaukee avenue they they had stuff but seriously people should go to, you people should go to wicker park and see what it's like because it still has traces of that old that older culture so but now but also another thing is about the tech, um, because I know that you're, you know, you're older than I am, but I really wanted to capture what it was like to not have a smartphone. Do you remember what it was like to not have a smartphone? Oh God, yes. A hundred percent. Good Lord. Yes. And then searching for pay phones and, uh, you know, answering machines being so important and, right. and the like, um, real fast, Mark, cause I want to direct people to where they can buy your book. I know they can get it on Amazon. But is there a, a more direct? Uh, yeah, wickerparkwishes.com. Wickerparkwishes.com. Okay. I'm, I'm creating the uh, yeah. the uh, banner for us to put underneath okay. us. Okay. Yeah, because this is basically the book, wickerparkwishes.com. And then you can get either the digital or the print. The print is, um, I have it here. The print is very, very good quality. It's a, it's paperback, but the cover is is soft and the, um, the pages are thick. So it's not like a typical paperback. But. I'm with you. And also yep. the the cover is very bright. So. No, it's again. Your husband did a great job on the cover. Yeah. Uh, he's uh, you know he's a Del is a Del Larkin. Everybody, a fine <laughs> Del Larkin who will never be on social media or anything. He doesn't make an appearance anywhere. He barely even goes out. So there you go. He's he's just a very talented, uh, quiet person. Oh, that's interesting. And uh, Jason from Hawaii wants to know: Are you looking to make this book uh, into a trilogy or a series? Because yeah. Without spoiling things, I could see more uh, work with Claire or more adventures with yeah, Claire. Yeah, I'm writing the second book. It's not, okay, I don't want to give away the ending, but it's not a continuation of the ending that's happening, but I take one character, it's a guy. I take a guy character and I put him in a second book. And cool. there's there's And then he's the love interest of another woman. So um, I'm going, actually, um, I'm on the second draft and I'm proud to say I've written 56,000 words. That's a lot of words of the second draft. So I'm serious oh, yeah. about this. No, that's wonderful. And then, uh, it is I a know series. that's excellent to hear. No, that's terrific. I'm going to even augment this and, and say, uh, to, uh, buy the book at, but see, um, and also the, um, also 
the the main characters are always female females but because I, of course i'm female um so it's easy for me to write from that perspective but i'm very fascinated in capturing older chicago because the reason why I wrote about it is because um, I see people on their phones and they're not really communicating or they're very detached from each other. And I thought, gosh, I remember when you actually had to show up to stuff because if you didn't show up, <laughs> if, if, if you said, let's meet at such and such cafe or such and such bar and you didn't show up, people would think, were you killed? Were you mugged? What happened? You couldn't text. You couldn't ghost people. Right. So I wanted to capture what it was like. Um, if you wanted to send somebody a note, you had to actually literally write a note and get it to them. Um, and also, if you were dating people, you know, you had to get a message on your answering machine. So if you if you came home and your answering machine was blinking, you were wondering, oh, my gosh, is this the guy or the girl I was interested in? So as much as things have changed, though, and I've noticed this both for the better or for the worst during covid. Uh, young people are, I mean, it was, that was one of the biggest great signs of back to normalcy in the late spring, early summer when we thought we were safer. Right. And, and it was so great to, I mean, I, I live in uh, Roscoe village and I would go to some of the hotter areas, uh, you know, and uh, Logan, Logan square, right. and some of the other one, the other surrounding neighborhoods by me and would see a lot of young people in line for the bars, inside the bars, right. all hanging out. Yeah. And of course, I mean, you know, God, especially at the very beginning and even throughout uh, COVID, sometimes our own Mayor Lightfoot would really get a crap yes. and go to the beach and just tell it to, like this crowd of people, go home. You well, she used, to, she, used to, she used to ride on the north side near Rogers Park, which is near Evanston. And she used to be like, you know, break up parties and stuff. So I thought, OK, that's real. That's real commitment. That's serious grassroots, you know, rounding up. <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine being in the middle of a party even back then and stuff when we were kids and it's just like, oh shit, the mayor's here. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. I know. And actually, well, the the most the in, most infamous party I went to when I was younger was um he passed away. He was a sports guy. Um uh oh my gosh, why am I blanking? Tim from channel two, uh, from CBS two. Um Oh, Tim Weigel. Weigel. Tim Weigel. What? Okay. So what happened was, <laughs> and when I met Jen Weigel and when I met Ray for Weigel, I told him this, um, they had just, he, they had just bought this house in East Evanston near the, you know, sort of near the lake and it was totally empty. And Ray for Weigel had a huge party and he, like everybody went and it was so much fun. So then when I saw them in the media, I thought, oh my gosh, I went to their, I went to his party because she was out of town. I think she wasn't around, but it's funny. That's, that's how I felt. When uh, people like Cusack and, and his sister and Jamie Gertz was a Skokie kid and yeah. she became a very popular actress, you know, from the 80s through the 90s and stuff. And even today. Um, yeah, it was really fun watching uh, these teenagers that I remember from parties yeah. and stuff suddenly being famous people. Uh, uh, Rain Wilson, of course, uh, uh, a guy that I went to school with who was a year younger than me. And uh, Ray, Ray was like, uh, had a, his, fa his father was a military man. Wow, okay. So he didn't spend a lot of time yeah. in Chicago, but, but we were in a couple a play together and stuff. And, um, well, John yeah. Cusack was in school in high school. He was a senior. I was a freshman when, um, when uh, class came out, when he was filming class and that was a big deal. Like, Ooh, what's going on here? He sure. gets to miss school. He gets to be in this movie. And, but I think, I think the thing about growing up in Evanston is, oh my gosh, there's so much going on. Okay. Uh, the thing about growing up in Evanston is that um, so many people are doing so many things that yes, it's impressive, but it's not like the only thing in town, you know? So it's not like, oh, he's in the movies. Oh my gosh. He's the most important person in this entire city. Actually, it's technically a city, but um, I don't want to get all nostalgic and say times are not necessarily better, but I think it's because I've lived in the city of Chicago for 27 years um, or 20. Yeah. Or 20, like many years actually. Um, and I, and I just see how things have changed yeah. and not a lot of people have lived in the city as long as I have, or not, or people have moved to the suburbs and I've actually seen right. it change a lot. And my husband's lived in the city for 50 years. Oh, there you go. So we'll talk about how things used to be better, worse, whatever. So I'm very obsessed with how the city has changed and how it's changing. I'm with you. And and again, um, that's what I think makes the book uh, special for people who live through it and, and can certainly relate. And also, I think um, it's a good eye opener for young people, which will find the differences, but also a lot of similarities. I mean, I really when um, even before the pandemic, 
when the economy really kind of tanked in the first part of the 2000s. Yeah. I felt bad for a lot of kids coming out of school complaining that, God, you know, I'm not in my career. Uh, I, I have this mountain of, of college debt. And everybody, I get it in terms of the mountain of debt is much greater than when I was in college or Margaret was in college. But that said, there is a very big part of me that's like, uh, that's what your 20s are. You aren't well, in your career yet. You you are struggling to establish a work record of I show up, I do my job. And even though it might be uh, everything from being a temp, like Claire, your character in Wicker Park Wishes, or working at an ice cream store or whatever, it's like, yeah, you got a shitty job, but you're establishing your work ethic and you're you're planning and eventually you will get into it if you're if you persist. So so I, well, honestly, I think I'm like I'm like, yeah, I, I get it, everybody, but also it's like uh this is not much different than I was in the eighties and nineties. Okay, can- but however, okay, let, there are a couple things that work here. One is people don't understand because they're young right. that actually going through hardship when you're younger is really great because you want to learn your lessons and then grow. You don't want to have everything work out for you and then reach 45 and get laid off like those baby boomers. Like they were they were living the dream and then at age 50 or whatever, they lost their job. Like now what do I do? Okay. Right. So hardship is good early on. Secondly, the reason why these people are talking so much about it, how hard they have it, is because they have the internet now and they can just type in millennial jobs and they can find like 500 articles about how hard they have it. And it becomes like an echo chamber. And then they believe their own media. Because I was teaching today at Columbia and I said, they're like going on and on. I said, okay, you guys, you know what? This is one of the best times to be alive. You can own it. Learn all this digital stuff. You have so many opportunities. Don't believe the hype. Don't believe the public. Atta girl. So, and also, you know, they are working. So I think it's just, gosh, I don't know what's going on inside. But anyway, they, they are working and um, they are, you know, I think that, they have to just, you know, go on their path and put aside the analysis because I cannot get over how much this generation is being analyzed. I think I think also because people are envious, older people are envious of them. That's you know? interesting. No, that's interesting. I, I, by the way, I would also say the privileged ones that didn't have the hardship, uh, that's the birth of the Karens. And uh, by the way, there are male versions of the Karens as well mm-hmm. that did have everything handed to them. And so, yeah, when, when a mid uh, middle age crisis comes up, they're not prepared and they don't know what to do. And also um, forgive the generalization. They're less interesting people yeah. uh, because they haven't, they haven't had to uh, learn how to live with a community of different people. And I, and I think uh, that's a big life lesson that again, if you're living Silver Spoon in the Burbs, and and only visit the city, then you know. And God, I have, I have friends that I went to college and yeah. high school with, that I mean, I still love them, but I also feel kind of like their worldview is kind of uh, hmm. limited. Right, and also especially people our age, because I don't meet a lot of people who st- who have stayed in the city. So then, so then you hear, this is, I think I'm gonna write a letter to the Tribune or something, because there are so many people who think, even though there's a lot of activity outside right now and I hear police cars and stuff, there are, there are these people who think the city, especially my area is this crazy area and we can't walk around. I just walked around for two hours and this, I read this one ludicrous um, online column by this guy who lives in the distant suburbs who just visited for a couple hours or something. And he said, oh yes, the people around there have to, uh, they have, they need to do a threat assessment. I'm like, so then I took a picture outside my balcony. I said, threat assessment? Like there, I mean, there are dogs, there are trees, there are people shopping. Like what's going on? I mean, um, but I think that what happened was, um, but you know, people, people choose their lifestyle. Right. Okay. Right. So it's okay. If you want to live in the suburbs, if you want to sure. you know, have your experiences, it's fine. But I personally like adventure and I like to learn. I like to be exposed to stuff. I like stimulation. Um, of course, I, I'm not an idiot like I used to be and do stupid things. But seven years ago, when I had the chance to move back in the city, I jumped at it because uh, I really missed the life. I mean, even when I was working at XRT in my late 20s into my early 30s, I uh, I, I absolutely took advantage of the nightlife of the 90s and the ability to walk into clubs or concerts or other big events and get on the guest list because I was working at WXRT. 
and it was great. And that's why I think I relate to a lot of, of what you have in terms of Wicker Park Wishes. I was in the city constantly. What do you think about the romantic aspect? Because, I mean, she's great. into... Okay, because that's, that's really cool. Because, like I said, these some guys read and they liked it. And I thought, this is definitely a woman who's into guys for sure. I mean... Well, so. yeah. No, I mean, she's not afraid of, of uh, pursuing aggressively uh, relationships as anyone would in their 20s. And I thought it was very genuine. I really did. Jason from Hawaii has another question. He's like, I'm being serious. Do you have plans to turn your book into an audio drama podcast series? That's it. I would love to make I would love to make it put it on a screen somehow. So I oh, need sure. to I need to write some kind of treatment or I'm in the WGA Writers Guild of America. So I better take advantage of that. I need to write up something. Yeah. Because but audio drama, that'd be cool. Yeah, you know, and honestly, it's something that I learned uh that uh, this is another way of getting your story out there if, as far as audio drama goes and uh having people take a serious look at it because it's being dramatized and uh and again i think i think there's a lot of great audio drama out there right now but that, the only thing is that you know to get the the talent you need the big bucks i'm not rich i'm not well, joe i mean i'm a podcaster but i'm not joe rogan with millions of dollars but so you've, if i were you've also i know uh from our friendship that you've established relationships with other Chicago writers yeah. and you're in a writer's group. And, you know, thank I, I, again, another reason why I really like this book is it is very um, Chicago centric. And, um, you, you know, we always get kind of uh, neglected from the big picture of the United States where there's the West coast, there's the, right. the New York area. Yeah, We're flyover country. We're flyover country. Exactly. Yeah. And it's like, no, man, I mean, we know, that Chicago has an incredible culture right. around it. It has a great live theater culture that has never died away. Right. And a lot of great actors come from Chicago and then make their bones in New York and LA and the like, but a lot of them also stay here. Uh, well, Netscape, well, I always think about, okay, this is what I was talking about um, elsewhere that I was saying that a lot of people think about Silicon Valley and all this innovation that's going on. But Netscape was created, Netscape, the internet browser that's not around anymore. Wasn't that created at University of Illinois, Champaign? That Netscape. I don't remember, but I but it wouldn't surprise me. And I had friends at U of I in the 80s that were very much aware and participating in the 80s internet before the big boom. And, and I right. love, there's a wonderful uh, movie that TNT made in the 90s called Pirates of Silicon Valley. And it really is both the Steve Jobs story and um, uh, what's his face from uh, the, the great billionaire uh, philanthropist from uh, Microsoft. Yeah. Um, Bill Gates, Bill Gates, excuse me. Yeah. It's a dual track of both of their stories. And one of the things you see are these great homemade computers yeah. from, from the early eighties. And one of my best friends from high school that went to U of I, he had a homemade computer and he's like, you want to know how many uh, Cokes, are in uh, the science department Coke machine at MIT. And I'm like, sure. Uh -huh. And he goes, we can look that up. And again, oh cause God. it was online right. and you could, you could see that stuff. Yeah. So no, I mean, I, I, I always love that. And yeah, man, I mean, it's, and again, you know, a couple hours from now, I may as well promote it. I'm doing my uh, kinescope show uh, yeah. about three hours from now. And one of the things we really haven't touched on it directly yet, but uh, television was coming from, not only New York and not only LA, but Philadelphia on the East Coast and Chicago was a big broadcast hub of yeah. network television. And eventually, we're going to do uh, an episode about Stud Turkle's hmm. uh, live television show from the early fifties. Oh my gosh! If, if things were different, that? yeah, I have. If, if things were different, um, I would love to do that kind of thing. Just interview regular people and find the stories. Oh my gosh! Oh yeah! Uh, oh my god! No, I, I got to I got to meet Studs a couple times in the wow. '90s and into the early 2000s, and uh, it was always an education. Yeah, and I just you know really, and it was terrific because he really, being so much younger and stuff, he really did treat me like another broadcaster. Yeah. And, well, you know, I mean, you you deal with this stuff, That's and so I'm like, cool. yeah, not like you, Studs. Yeah, dude, he's a, yeah, he's a he's a legend. But the thing is, he's also a, a complete journalist. But I was going to say, um, one thing I do I do want to bring up is uh, that a lot of people don't understand is the early days of the internet, because I do write about that. And um, it was, we didn't know which way it was going to go. I mean, I wasn't a geek, okay, but I, I did go online. I went online in 94, because luckily I had a brother who understood this stuff, luckily. 
And um, this is before AOL and things like that. And I just remember it being a time of change, but we didn't know how it was going to change. And now what's happened is there's a lot of freedom in expression, but there's also a lot of shenanigans going on online. And back then it was really, only, there weren't many people online. Right. And, and also, right. you know, you had bulletin boards and you, know, you might chat with somebody online, but there'll be some geek in, you know, in a good way in Singapore or something. And now right. you just, you're like, Ooh, what's lurking now? It sort of can be sort of scary. Oh, that's interesting. I guess, again, because what I do, even with word balloon started by promoting it on message boards back in 2005. Yeah. And, um, I don't go on message boards anymore. Well, I don't know. I mean, they don't really, they're not yeah. really as active because of social media. Right. Right. But I, but I'm not afraid of Twitter. And I mean, I use Twitter constantly. Mm -hmm. um, you know, yeah. What, what social media are you active on? I like Twitter because first of all, I like the company. Um, and I also like, I, I could spend an hour on Twitter and I walk away and I've learned a lot. Whereas on other social media platforms, I walk away and I think, wow, I just ate like a lot of cake. But I don't know if that cake is good for me. So, and, tw and Twitter's a really great way to find out, you know, breaking news, and it's also a great way to learn languages. Like I follow non-English um, accounts, like I follow Japanese accounts especially. And if I don't know a word or a kanji, a character, I'll copy it and I'll paste it into Google Translate, and I actually walk away thinking, oh, I just learned a few kanjis today. Oh, that's awesome. Are you a are you a manga person? Well, sort of. I mean, I have my manga here. Um, I'm not like hardcore manga, but here's my here. Yeah, this my is a manga. This is a manga made for. Um, it's called. This is an older one. It's called. Um, uh, Sayonara uh, mini skato. Goodbye mini skirt. Yeah. And yeah. um, and what I cool. see what I like. This is good because this is really written for young people. Yeah. But the way it's written is it's easier to read the Japanese. That's why I bought it. So it's All basically right. about high school stuff. That's cool. <laughs> yeah. Jason Jason is very proud from uh and he's another podcaster by the way. Dude, what do you want to know if you or your family have ever been to Hawaii? No, but I know that there's a lot of Japanese language there, right? Oh, by my, my my dad was stationed in Hawaii because of World War II. Oh, wow. And cool. he yeah, he was stationed in Hawaii and actually he was being trained. This is really strange. He was actually being trained trained to invade Japan and in the early nineties, I ended up living on the Island that he was trained to invade. Wow. Kyush Kyushu Island. Wow. And the reason no. why, and the reason why they didn't go to Japan is because they dropped the bomb, which That's is right. of course a horrible thing. Um, my dad was at the atom bomb test at the, at the, uh, atom bomb testing. Oh my God. There were, there were a few of them. There were a few of them. Cause my father was also training in California for the land invasion of Japan. Wow. And, uh, like you said, because of the bomb ended up instead being sent to the other side of the world and was part of the German occupation okay. in Vienna. Right. And I always like to point out the, the great movie, The Third Man. Yeah. And when uh, I had never seen it before, and my dad saw that it was on at like two in the morning on one of the five right. channels we grew up with. Right. Said, hey, you want to see how it was for me in the army? I'm like, yeah. And he goes, yeah. we're watching The Third Man. But I always tell my sister, as horrible as the bomb was for Hiroshima and Nagasaki and stuff. I'm like, um, if you see things like D-Day, right. and they were planning a D-Day-like invasion, yes. an invasion of Japan. I'm like, uh, we may not have existed, right? And Our actually, like, when I was killed in that land invasion, because I lived in uh, Kagoshima uh, Prefecture, and that's a, it's uh, Japan's four main islands. the The fourth main island is Kyushu, and I and my dad was supposed to invade Kyushu. He was being trained. He was being trained, and I remember he came to Kyushu, and he's like wow, this is so strange because this is what I, where I was supposed to go. And um, no, but he did go to the anti bomb testing. My dad, I, I told the students this today. My dad was a high school teacher at Evanston High School. And um, what was his uh, subject? Um, combined studies and history. So okay. uh, American history, European history. And um, so the students would make fun of him and they'd say, oh, you're so short, you're so short. And he's like, I was at the atom bomb testing, okay? And that's why I'm short. And they're like, <gasps> and then he's like, no, I'm just kidding. He's a short. <laughs> <laughs> that's like that's like a yearly joke. <laughs> Absolutely, man. No, that's terrific. That's yeah. great. But uh, there, there were a few atom bomb testings. Um, because he was in the navy, so yeah, yeah. he was at the one. Because I know that some of them jumped in the water and they got these horrible illnesses. Wow. And, but he didn't get that. So. Do you know the story too of um, the John Wayne Susan Hayward movie, The Barbarian and the Geisha, which was about Genghis Khan? Uh, they made it in. Um, they made it both on location in Nevada, 
around where the atomic testing was. And they made the even more horrible mistake of getting dump trucks and, and grabbing sand from the mm -hmm. area, bringing it back to Hollywood on the sound stages to be able to shoot wow. other scenes. And literally uh, so many people that were in that production ended up dying of cancer, including oh Susan gosh. Hayward and John Wayne. Wow, uh, so, you know, I mean, there was no clinical look, but it's like, yeah, right. yeah you know, I mean, obviously, and, and, and I mean, of course, we know from uh, recent movies the uh, ridiculous uh, scene of uh, Indiana Jones uh, right. in the last movie when uh, everyone says they nuke the fridge and, uh, you know, Indy sa he saves himself being in the lead line refrigerator. Oh, gosh. Yeah. 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 But anyway, um, oh, it's funny. You know, you you in the last couple of days have pointed me. I wanted to bring this up <laughs> because I'm, I'm such a fan. Uh, and then you're poking holes in one of my uh, comedic heroes, uh, Mel Brooks. A uh, really wild uh, docu uh, biography called Funny Man. Yeah. yeah, that is a warts and all Mel Brooks uh, accounting of his of his uh, life and his career. Yeah, because yeah, I was saying, I was saying before, before this interview, interview even, even though, though I can hear I can my hear voice, voice, but I can hear. Um, I'm sorry, I was saying this before that we should talk about this, but um, yeah, for some reason, okay, I'm really into early Hollywood, early TV. I even read a book about Chicago Hollywood. I mean, Hollywood in Chicago with um, SNA on the North side. Yes. The chapel, the, the silent student. That's so funny yes. because I too have been reading a lot about SNA E S S N A Y. And I just want to, for a second say that before the movie industry moved to California, their first move from the East coast was to the West, the Midwest. Yes. And um, Bronco Billy, one of the very first, Cowboy stars, Bill Anderson, I believe it's Bronco Billy Anderson. Uh, he was um, the uh, he was part of a well, he was the A in S and A. That was what it you know, phonetically, that's why it was called that. But it was founded by uh, a guy that was in the great train robbery, the Edison mm -hmm. produced silent western of the very early era of, of silent movies. And within five years, he and his partner created the studio in Chicago and Chaplin spent a very formative. Yeah, no, a lot of people, a lot of people say that. I mean, he spent like a year. I mean, he didn't spend yeah, but a again, ton of time, but still, it yeah. was still, yeah, but it was still like a big, I still think, early. well, and, and this, these are the earliest examples of the tramp was right, while he was true. at SNA. And so yeah. that's why I agree with you. It was short, but it was, I believe it was very formative. And also in the early silent, silent era, SNA was one of the players. They were one right. of the definitely one of the. That, that's why I'm fascinated with early. See, now Hollywood is saturated. Just throw it on the pile. No big deal. Whatever. They're outsourcing to other countries. But back then, yeah. I mean, cities. for instance, like people often talk about these these East Coast writers and they're writing for the stage, and then they say, "Do you want to go out to Hollywood?" Like what? Like, yeah. Why California? would I do that? Yeah, yeah. Why would I do that? Orange trees. Like, why do I want to go out to the sticks? And now, of course, everybody wants to go to Hollywood. They want to make the big bucks. They want to be part of it. Which is very fascinating. So anyway, with the Mel Brooks, I kept telling you to read it because you're you know, you're all starry eyed about Mel Brooks. And I said, OK, please read this, <laughs> this biography, because you'll see him differently or you'll see him more realistic. Well, and yeah. And again, allegedly, it's, we just say allegedly because I guess he likes to sue people. So, well, yeah. And and, and uh, I don't know. Uh, it seems like uh, this writer uh, did talk to a lot of people. I also do think that some of his judgment, even on the creative side, is a little curt when it comes to Brooks and other uh, productions that Brooks worked on, okay. um, you know, obviously his association with Sid Caesar really was would put Mel Brooks on the map before the 2000 year old man. And his but own he work. makes it sound like this writer makes it. First of all, you said he talked to a lot of people, but he all he said very clearly at the end of the book, he said, I've written biographies before. This is the only one where it's very hard to talk to people because everybody's afraid of being sued by Mel Brooks as if Mel Brooks is not rich enough. He's extremely wealthy. Oh yeah, very powerful Hollywood guy. Absolutely. Yeah, very A list. Yeah. Um, yeah. But the thing is that um, the thing that came out about Sid Caesar that I saw is that he he was friends with Sid Caesar. He ingratiated himself to Sid Caesar. He was like a jester to Sid Caesar, and Sid Caesar liked him. Therefore, everybody else had to put up with him. But the impression I get is, if it weren't for Sid Caesar, Caesar, he wouldn't have gotten a break. Maybe I, I also think he had his own uh, innate charm and they forgave him for a lot of things that he did. It seems like Mel Tolkien, uh, yeah. who was the head writer of uh, the Caesar shows and also uh, became a very important all in the family writer as well in the yeah. 70s, uh, that he 
forgave a lot of uh, the, the the little BS kind of things. And also, um, I, I'm sorry, I think there's too much emphasis on, well, you know, he wasn't a real writer. He was a talking writer, a performing writer. And it's like, um, again, I just, having done Word Balloon now for 16 years and talking to various writers. Yeah, Sweet 16. What did you wear to your Sweet 16? What outfit did you wear? What's that? What outfit did you wear to your Sweet 16? I'm joking. I didn't, uh, yeah, <laughs> I, it, was, uh, it was a leisure suit. It was a ruffled leisure, leisure suit with really bad brown piping. It was it was disgusting. Uh, much like my own Sweet 16, absolutely. But um, I, I, uh, I know a lot of writers that are talking writers and that okay. don't sit down in front of the typewriter. And even his mother made fun of the fact that, yeah, my son's a writer, right? And said so the guy couldn't spell if it wasn't worth it. By the way, he made fun of that all the time. In fact, the two thousand year old man, he and he's talking about Shakespeare, and he's like, he's a, he was a terrible writer. The F's look like B's. The right. he goes, he had the worst penmanship ever. And and I I'm a shitty writer. I I'm a I'm a guy who's written a ton of of uh, radio copy. Okay. And thank God there's you know spell check and and all that stuff because I'm a horrible writer. Well, there and, there's a Mel Brooks uh, short that he mentions in this book. It's critic. called The Critic. Yes. So funny we should play yes. it i we love play it now yes no no i'm not gonna know i'm, I'm okay. more worried about copyright infringement than oh I that's am, true but, okay oh yeah because but, but it's fantastic i don't want to be sued by you. him yeah the the it's uh, the critic um yeah everybody should look I mean. that up yeah it's on youtube that, that's what i mean I, I can point to and or even the 2000 year old man yeah i'm like no this is a funny oh, writer funny. i don't know how to break it not to you but i'm saying to the biographer it's like yeah mel's actually funny i mean a lot of it is yeah mel you know um hits you with one-liners and shtick and all this other stuff yeah. to cover up for the fact that he really doesn't have a good idea. And it's like, uh, well, he used to throw out he has a lot plenty of ideas. good ideas. He's yeah, he, used to, he's, ideas. he used to throw out a lot of good ideas, a lot of ideas. And then some of them were good, but you know, it could be right. maybe people had sour grapes. Maybe that's why they talked to this guy and they didn't paint a good uh, picture. I don't know. But all and again, I mean, and he does correctly point out that Carl Reiner has always been, yeah. Was all you know throughout his life a, a staunch supporter of Mel's and everything. Um, I'm not saying he's a great guy in his personal life. I don't know. Well, now I think he, I think, I think he, you know, everybody, a lot of people mellow with age. I'm sure he's an awesome sure. guy now. Yeah, he's in his 90s. God, I, I saw him six years ago at the Chicago Theater. Wow, they showed Blazing Saddles, it was a full house, yeah. and I really thought, um, I wasn't sure what to expect because it was billed as an evening with Mel Brooks. Yeah. And they showed the whole movie, which surprised me. I thought they maybe would show a montage or just the first few minutes. Yeah. And then he stuck around and did an hour Q&A wow. with somebody on stage. And it was great. Wow. The, the stories you've heard a million times, wow. him and Cary Grant, uh, him. Right. I mean, all, all, the, all the famous anecdotes that he would, to this day, still loves to pull out. Yeah. Kind of like Rickles when he would talk about Carson and yeah. Various uh, and working on Run Silent Run Deep, or with Gable and great actors as he did over. Although, the by the way, you should—I don't know—I'm I'm sure people disagree with me. Uh, read that Carson biography that his lawyer wrote. Oh, I read it. Uh, yeah, Henry Bushkin, Bob Baskin. Yeah, because people like, oh, how dare he? Does he even Instagram? Like, I thought it was incredible. Oh, it's an interesting so story. Well it is kind of weird that you know you always hear attorney-client privilege and that. You know, they're supposed to keep their mouth shut and everything. And this guy's like, oh, I'm happy to write a book. Well, but um, I'm sure he didn't say everything. But the thing is, what's interesting about that book is that he, it really revealed his own weaknesses that he felt like he was getting into something wrong and he just went along with it. In the end, he was burned. What, yes. a, what an incredible book. No, I agree with you on all that. Um, and again, Carson, another guy that if you delve in his personal life, there's a lot of demons and a oh, yeah. lot of bad behavior. Yeah. And uh, I mean, Ter horrible to his first wife in a lot of similar ways to Brooks. And I, yeah. and having read Carson biographies, I was aware of Carson's background too. Um, but the, you know, the, the theme, but my, I remember my dad used to give me a hard time because my dad read a ton and he read a lot of history and stuff and, and, and architecture. And I would always be reading something about Hollywood and he'd say, why are you into so, so much of this? But one thing I've learned is that these people became so extremely successful. A lot of these people I read about, that it's really hard not to be arrogant. Come on, you're A-list. You have everything. You are a multimillionaire. You've everything given to you. You can get a good table at whatever restaurant. You know? Well, God, and, and even Brooks uh, being so close to Caesar, European trips and making a TV yeah. show in England. and um, But Caesar a had a lot of issues. Oh, absolutely. I wouldn't mind reading his 
inspiring. You should. It's called Where Have I Been? Okay. And it's from the early, it's from the mid eighties. And he was very honest about his alcoholism and uh, just being burnt out. And yeah. um, because he really was, from his weekly uh, show of shows to Caesar's yeah. Hour to everything he did by the mid '60s right. was really burnt out, oh, and, yeah. and also was used to a level of professionalism dealing with live television. That as things moved on to videotape, he felt the business got lazy. Wow! And so he would be a guest on variety shows, and of course he had a variety show, and just be like, "I can't believe." Oh, we'll pick it up. Oh, we'll do another take right. and stuff. And it's like, why don't people know their lines? Exactly. Why don't well, that's vaudeville. See that? Okay, because I I used to think, why are these? Why were there so many variety shows? And I think it's because it evolved from vaudeville. And these guys, a yeah. lot of these men and women, they were so extremely talented because they had to bring it every night live. They'd have tomatoes thrown at them, and they didn't make it. So that's why well, they were no so laughs. good. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So I think no, that's I why agree. they were they were like ready to perform. And that's why probably why you thought these people were spoiled because it's like we didn't get second takes in vaudeville or the Berkshires or wherever they went. Well, you know, and, and Caesar would always say he'd be talking to aspiring comedy writers and they'd go, Mr. Caesar, we understand your show was 90 minutes long. How long did it take you to do the show? And he'd be like, uh, 90 minutes. 90 minutes, right. Yeah, it's like, you know, and it's like, well, well you know, weren't you able to go back? He's like, no, it was live. Right. And, and that's why I love doing Kinescope. And I'm so glad that uh, my buddy Gabe Hardman, who is like, "Hey, what do you, what are your feelings on live television wow. for a podcast?" I'm like, "Yes, please." Yeah, because that uh, um, that era had this energy of you got to do the show. Yeah, and also like you were saying earlier about uh, Broadway people not being willing uh, to go to L.A. in the early days of the silent era. Yeah. Um, this is how we got the great uh, generation of writers and directors and yeah. performers in television because. They couldn't get their stuff made on on stage in in New York, right. and it was like, hey, we'll give you literally sometimes twenty five bucks to get your story on a shitty anthology show, yeah. and it's like, yeah, sold because they wanted their stuff performed. But what's really sad though is um, like what happened at Judy Garland. What's really sad is that these people got these variety. Some of these people got these variety shows, and they had to bring it every night several times. It was very grueling, and it made them ill. I mean, I think it's just yeah. Hard. Oh God. I am fascinated by Judy Garland's variety show because she so clearly was ill-suited to be the host the way like a Carol Burnett was right. or any any variety show host. And and finally, somebody at, at the end of the TV contract is like, you know, put Judy in a gown, put her in front of an orchestra and just let her sing. That's what she does. And you watch, I, I, I truly uh, get TV one of the digital uh, channels, and I don't know if it's mm -hmm. available in every market. It's here. It was here in Chicago, and also there are examples on on YouTube. You watch those very formatted, almost like Carol Burnett right. comedy sketch song variety shows that she started with on her show, and she's a deer in headlights. Right. But then, thank God, like I said, in the last few weeks, they're like, "Here, this will yeah. save a ton of money, and also we're going to get a better show." Put her in a nice dress and just let her right. sing. That's what people want. Well, I saw, I, saw, I saw a documentary with her of of her, and um, they said that it's because she always want she always was really into the audience, and it just could really burn her out. Like she loved the audience so much, she wanted to give everything to the audience. Yeah, and uh, yeah, she would be spent from an energy standpoint. No, Alan mm -hmm. King opened for her, the great comedian. Mm -hmm. He wrote a lot about her. The best book about that period of Judy Garland's variety show. And I I haven't seen it reprinted. I was able to get an old copy of it. Mm. I'm stumbling across a Dick Cavett episode. I love Dick Cavett. Oh, there you go. And the Velvet Fog, Mel Torme is a guest on the <laughs> show. And he had just released this book about his experience as the music director on Judy Garland's variety wow. show. And this is mid-career Mel Torme killing it in jazz. Yeah. And Judy Garland's like, I want you to be my music director. And he's like, you know, Judy, I'm trying to get my own career going. Right. Please, please, please. And he's like, how could I say no? It's Judy Garland. Yeah. And just a, how it was such a train wreck of a show with talented people. Yeah. George, George Schlatter, who later went on to create Laugh-In, was one of the uh, uh, showrunners yeah. for the variety show. And a lot of it was just Julie, Judy was ill-suited to host this show at the yeah. end of the day. And yeah, so no, I'm, I'm uh, again, but, I'm 
I'm fascinated by that. But it's funny. I've seen, I've watched laughing and I think it's, to me, it's like a sixties version of vaudeville. I just really think that a lot of stuff came from vaudeville because when they, when they, when they changed the medium, but see that happens to us today. So for instance, well, somebody will be popular in social media and then they'll get a show. So it just seems like a lot of things evolve from what's really popular. And I think it's why we don't really see a lot of variety shows anymore. But wait, you were, um, did you ever, uh, was going to say there was, um, Rec- I recently saw a biography on of uh, Alan Carr. Oh, He's- sure. I watched that documentary. It was great. Yeah, uh, yeah, the documentary. Great producer, yeah. yeah, the great producer of both stage and film. And uh, infamously, his greatest height was uh, making the movie Grease. Right. And then right after that, his lowest low, Can't Stop the Music, the movie with Bruce Jenner when he was right. when she was still Bruce Jenner and yeah. uh, Valerie Perrine and the Village People. Uh, I just had a filmmaker on who did an incredible Valerie Perrine documentary. Wow! And obviously, that's uh, you know, God, Valerie Perrine was riding high, yeah. uh, culminating in her appearance in the Superman movie. Yeah. And then made Can't Stop the Music, and it it definitely put well, a dent was- in her career. I mean, she still worked, but it was. Not not the easy and amazing climb that she had in the seventies. But what what's interesting is um Alan Carr, which is his, his real name was Alan Solomon. He was from uh, Highland Park, so I tried to look at some stuff because I think his dad was a furniture dealer or something for a furniture salesman. But I just thought it was very interesting because going back to what we were talking about before with the North Shore and so forth, as long as you know these people coming up, and it's really interesting how some people can acknowledge recognize early on that they're going to make it big. Like, I think a lot of people acknowledge that. Well, they don't, they don't, they don't take no for an answer. They keep, they keep persistent. And uh, truly, I mean, that's, and honestly, I give you a lot of credit with this first book and I'm so glad that you're working on subsequent books because uh, yeah, no, the, the, you and I are cut from the same cloth. It's like, uh, I, I refuse to take no. I've, I've certainly in my radio career have been fired several times. I've had program directors that didn't understand what I do and maybe my value for a company and that's fine. And I and with with age comes perspective. I won't call it wisdom, right. but it is like okay, um, my expectations and this management's expectations, much like we said earlier about Howard Stern and, and uh, Kevin, they don't they don't fit. That's fine. That's but that, fine. that's all. But also, um, I think well, first of all, not without going into you know, it's like off the record. Like I can't talk about the details, but I do know from people because after I did that interview, people told me some stuff, and he wasn't like Mister Square or whatever. You know what I mean? Um, he was doing his job. That's the impression I got. Oh, Kevin, Kevin sure, right. Sure. The thing that just really bothered me is that I don't like people dissing people if they don't know the people. It's not fair. Sure. It's it's slant. It's it's uh, it's not fair to the person. They can't speak up. Um, totally. Well, and then, that's what happened because I, I would meet people. I would meet people and they'd say, oh, he's done it. I'm like, oh, when did you work for him? Oh, I never did. Well, then why are you talking about him? And then, then people got this impression. Like I said, I was, I was friends with them. But that's my one problem. And people will relate because it, it certainly did um, strike a chord with people that remember the era. Uh, the ESPN sports documentary series about the Bulls and the last dance. And as, as a foot soldier that was bearing witness to this working in sports radio while it was happening, and I'm no fan of Jerry Krause's, but it really kind of angered me at the level of, well, yeah, you wanted somebody to blame, blame Jerry Krause. And it's like uh, Jerry Krause was a manager, uh, del- you know, uh, right. sending out the wishes of the basketball owners. Yeah. Because everyone points to after 98, well, how come they didn't keep the party going? And it's like, don't ask Jerry Krause. Yeah, Jerry Krause handed out the pink slips on orders from the owners, and not just Jerry Reinsdorf, by the way, yeah. but but a group of owners that are like, um, well, if we re-sign everybody, it's going to cost us this much of money, and we've already made a ton of money from the championships. Yeah. Maybe it's time to rebuild. Right. And again, I mean, after six uh, years of incredible success out, yeah. of, ten, you know, out of eight, it's like, you know, and I would even uh, count those. Well, I think things. it's because in hindsight, the Bulls have done so badly since then. So that's but, why people. Well, yeah, but that's, you know, Margaret, honestly, as you likely know, a lot of that is because um, it's a willingness to spend money at a, at a, almost a deficit to get that championship ring. And I, I don't think there are many organizations that are willing to put their balls on the table and, and really do that. To maintain, I mean, you had Steinbrenner for decades with the Yankees, and yeah. even now the you know the current ownership and everything. And I don't even know if it is still 
Steinbrenner's family or not, I'm very happy to be out of sports. But I mean, it really, it's it's just, I mean, I'm sorry. It's just a natural thing of, okay, you have a, you have your championship run. Now you got to rebuild. Well, what happened to the Cubs? I, I made mean, mistakes in the rebuilding. Okay, but I, but, you know, one re one of the reasons why I like watching um the so the White Sox games and then the pregame and the postgame is because Ozzie Guillen was a player. He's also a manager, and sometimes he shares what it was like to be a manager. Like you go out in the media and they say all these things, and you drink when you win, you drink when you lose. I'm like, wow, this guy's. I would love to interview this guy for my podcast. Oh yeah, I mean, he would never oh, no. do it, but no, Ozzie's it's very a, interesting. No. But he's it's interesting a, to get that hear that insight. One hundred percent, absolutely. Well, listen, buddy, I'm going to have to wrap up because I got to get ready for my next show. Okay. Uh, but but uh, again, Wicker Part Wishes is the name of the book. Uh, I really I love the tangents we have uh, gone into. But there's the yeah, cover. Yeah, I can talk for like five hours about this stuff. So. Oh, no, absolutely. Well, when the next book is ready, come back. Okay, yeah, there's definitely going to be a next book, everybody. So That's wonderful. And again, everybody uh, that's watching can see it. But for the audio audience, you can buy the book at wickerparkwishes.com. You can also buy it at Amazon. It's widely out there, and it's a tremendous look at 90s life in Chicago from our author, Margaret Larkin. Thank it's you. Buddy, honestly, thank you for doing this. It was great. And uh, well, it's, it's like it's like when people went on Carson, then he asked to be sit on the couch. They they did they did a step they did a stand up and then Carson brought them to the couch. That's how I feel about being on your podcast. Oh, thanks, man. I didn't even ask to be on your podcast. You asked me, I'm like, oh, I've been invited yeah. to the couch with uh Johnny Carson. So Margaret, like I say to a lot of my comic book creator friends, uh, I think what we do, and certainly in the case of podcasting, but even now as you're pursuing your writing and stuff, uh, we're all creating content. I feel a real kinship with uh, creative people in this way. We're all kind of figuring this out. It's a new frontier in the best way where I think uh, anybody can do it that persists. Yeah. And it's just a matter of gathering an audience and getting them aware of your content. And uh, this is good. So I'm always happy to expose a quality uh, product right, thank you. Uh, to my audience. So yeah, no, it's my pleasure. I really Absolutely. appreciate it. No, my pleasure, buddy. So uh, everybody join me in about... Um, Two and a half hours uh, at 1130 Central, uh, 1230 a.m. I know Eastern. Uh, Jason's in Hawaii, so it's uh, not that not that late in the evening for him, but it's 930 Pacific. Uh, it's like another four hours, I think, for Hawaii time. But um, join us for Kinescope tonight. We're going to discuss the quiz show scandals, which is a fascinating subject. Of course, there's the Robert Redford film quiz show that depicted it so well about, about the same uh, period as uh, Wicked Park Wishes, honestly, about 25-year-old movie or so. Uh, but uh, it's it's an amazing story that a lot more celebrities than you realize were involved and and could have really had their careers ruined by the scandal. And it's kind of interesting that most of them got a, a slap on the wrist. Uh, even Patty Duke, a couple years before the Patty Duke sitcom and literally right before she was going to be on Broadway playing Helen Keller in The Miracle Worker, it was discovered she was one of the contestants that got the answers in advance. Mm. And that really could have ruined that kid. Uh, she was only 12 when she was on the quiz shows, and it was 15 uh, when when the scandal was uh, made public and she had to testify. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's one of the cool little stories you'll learn about more in about two hours or so when we discuss the quiz show scandals on Kinescope. It sounds really interesting. Thank you, buddy. I, I, well, again, if, if you don't mind, I, I don't know what your work schedule is like tomorrow, but if not, it's going to be up there on video and audio. So I hope you'll watch and listen. All right, until then, everybody, thank you a lot. 